Today, we are going to be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 1 through 15. Again, that's 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 1 through 15. Now, last week we talked about the days prior to the crowning of a king in Israel. If you missed out on last week's message and would like to catch up, I just wanted to let you know that it is available here on our Facebook page, but also on our new YouTube page, which is called HNC Vids. Um, if you haven't checked out our YouTube page yet, I encourage you to do so. Give it a look this week. We're always trying to post new stuff. In those days that we talked about last week, those days before Israel had a king, Israel was led by a judge and prophet named Samuel. Where we pick up the story today, Samuel has grown old, and he's ready to retire. Like the priest Eli before him, Samuel was a great man of God, but he was a pretty lousy father. His sons are sinful and corrupt, and the people of Israel do not want to entrust leadership of Israel to these men. Instead, they came to Samuel and demanded that he anoint a man to be king over Israel so they could be just like all the other nations. Samuel warned them that selecting a man meant rejecting God as their ruler and that there would be dire consequences as a result. And Israel decided that was just fine by them. So, God chose Saul the Benjamite to become the first king of Israel. Samuel anointed him, and Saul achieved an early victory in his career. When the Ammonites, a uh, foreign people that had been a regular enemy of Israel, laid siege to the town of Jabesh, and the power and fury of God came on Saul as he led his troops in a successful campaign of liberation. Seeing that Saul is well on his way, Samuel announces his retirement. He gives a farewell speech in which he encourages Israel to remain faithful and thus experience the help and blessing of the Lord. So, we can see that Israel's monarchy had a pretty strong start until the return of the dreaded Philistines. First defeated by God through Samson, then again by God through Samuel, Israel's old nemesis is back for round three. They bring a massive invading army, and Israel is terrified. The people are fleeing to hide in caves and thickets and mountains. Some are even fleeing the country. Saul rallies his troops, but when they see the massive army that they face, they begin to flee as well. As he watches his army shrink, Saul awaits the arrival of Samuel. Samuel has promised to offer a sacrifice and to seek God's favor prior to the battle, as is Israel's custom. Believing Samuel will come too late, Saul offers the sacrifice himself, which he knew was sinful for him to do. And as soon as he's done, Samuel arrives. He rebukes him, cursing Saul. Samuel tells him that the kingship will be torn away from his family due to his sin. Saul tries to prevent this from happening by repenting, to bring the kingdom back to his family line, but it's all to no avail. And in this whole scenario, it becomes clear that Saul believes it is by the blood, sweat, tears, and sacrifices of men that victories are won on the battlefield. He has not been a good student of history, because if he had studied the biographies of Samson and the sons of Eli, he would have understood the moral that those stories tried to present. That these men who tried to take on the Philistines with only human strength to support them died as a result. Saul does not offer the sacrifice with a clean heart. It might seem like a pious and practical thing to do, but in truth, he's just trying to speed things up so fewer troops will have the chance to flee before the battle begins. He thinks it's the waiting and shrinking army that will be his undoing. If only he had learned from the story of Gideon, which we studied just a couple months ago. I know it seems like eons ago because we were actually together, but we did talk about the story of Gideon. And we talked about how whether it's a small army or a large army, God can stretch out his arm and achieve victory. 
God is all-powerful. God is utterly free. If the troops are going to leave, let them leave. God doesn't need people to win the battle. And the stage was set for something amazing to happen. A story like the Exodus or the battles of Joshua, where God acts miraculously and comes to Israel's aid. The story of Saul could have been a story that would point generations back to God in worship and faith. But Saul short-circuits this whole situation by trying to make something happen on his own. This is who Saul is becoming. It's a turning point in his life, a bad turning point. Though he had a solid start, Saul gets a big head, thinking victory and glory all come because of some intrinsic value that he humanly brings to the field. And ultimately, his big head will lead to sin, and Saul will become filled with wrath. He'll become bipolar. He'll become depressed, murderous, selfish, manipulative, self-destructive, deceptive, arrogant, and ultimately suicidal. Keep that image of Saul in your mind, because that's who he is at this point in the story. And now, we're going to read about a very different young man. Today, we're going to read about Jonathan, the war hero, the prince of Israel and son of Saul. So, let's read together. In 1 Samuel 14, 1 through 15, hear the word of the Lord. One day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migran. With him were about 600 men, among whom was Ahijah, who was wearing an ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitub, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest, in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes, and the other Senna. One cliff stood to the north toward Michmash, and the other toward the south of Gibeah, of Geba. Jonathan said to his young armor-bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing, hear that, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, come on then. We will cross over toward them and let them see us. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. Then panic struck the whole army those in the camp and field, those in the outposts and raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Abba Father, it is so good to be in your house today with my friends, with my family. I thank you for them. I thank you for everyone at home who will be rejoining us soon. I pray, Lord, that you would bless us and keep us healthy and holy. God, in particular, I think of the, of the person that Joey brought up who is having a very tough season. And I pray that you be close to them. As the way maker, as the one who brings victory, bring victory in their life. Give them peace. Encourage them. Give them strength. May our family come around them. 
And whether it's sickness or unemployment, Lord, we pray that you would come to their aid. And today as we study your word, we pray that it would be as bread to us, that it would sustain us and build us up and give us strength. God, I pray that these words that I share would not be my words, but your words of what you want to do among us. Bless me now as I preach and bless us now as we hear your words, Lord. Pray this in your name. Amen. It's like night and day, isn't it? Jonathan gets so much right that his father gets wrong. The Philistines have invaded, and where is Israel's king? He's sitting under a tree with his troops, waiting for something to happen. He has a man named Ahijah with him who's wearing an ephod, an ephod was a linen garment traditionally worn by priests in Israel. It is also said that the priest kept a couple stones in the ephod called the umum, the umim and the thumim, um, and that these were used to cast lots. Ancient Jews believed that God would control the outcome of the lots as they were cast, and that's how they would figure out what God's will was. So outwardly, it seems like Saul is acting pious. He's waiting for God's direction, and he has one of God's servants with him ready to reveal God's will. But as we saw in his past, and we'll see again in his future, Saul's heart is far from God. The priest isn't there to deliver the word of the Lord. The priest is there to cover Saul's obligated religious bases. And while Saul once acted too impetuously, too quickly, too thoughtlessly, in offering a sacrifice that cost his family the kingdom, Saul now sits passively, sitting on his hands, and doing nothing. Invaders are in his land, harassing and killing his people, and he sits under a tree doing nothing. Saul has swung from one extreme of acting too quickly all the way to the other of not acting at all. Is this what Saul did when he liberated the people of Jabesh? No! When he heard about what was going on in Jabesh, he rallied his troops and he went to battle that night. But as he acted quickly, he didn't overstep his role to try and force God's support as he did when the Philistines faced him the first time. When he was aligned with the will of God, he acted decisively and effectively but now he sits there doing nothing. All the while, his people suffer. And so we can see that at this point in his life, Saul is already on a steep decline. But where is the prince? Where is Jonathan? Jonathan is off causing a ruckus. Jonathan is being proactive like his father was in his youth, Jonathan, Jonathan decides that the time for action has come. And seeing his father sitting under a tree doing nothing and not wanting to be deterred by him, Jonathan slips away in secret with only his armor bearer to back him up. They go to a Philistine outpost. And when they arrive, Jonathan makes a statement, a statement which reveals the condition of his heart, his understanding of the God he serves, and draws a sharp contrast between Jonathan and his father. And that contrast is this. Come, he says, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps, perhaps, the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving whether by many or by few. This statement demonstrates that Jonathan's faith is great. He believes that God can achieve victory. Not only that, he understands that God is utterly free to do as God pleases. Unlike the Philistines, unlike the sons of Eli, and unlike his own father, Jonathan understands that no sympathetic magic, no shallow piety, and no abduction of God's throne can force God to do our will. Because as we talked about last week, our God is not armless. 
God does what he wants, when he wants, with his incredible power, and no one can stop him. God can free a nation with a massive army or with just a couple of overzealous kids. But God is also free to tell those kids, no, I don't want you to attack this outpost. Go home. Jonathan wants to be proactive, but he has the wisdom to seek the Lord's will in an appropriate way before acting impetuously. So, Jonathan asks for a sign to reveal to him what God would have him do. His sign is fulfilled, and he goes up to pick a fight. Amazingly, he drops 20 Philistine troops, and his armor-bearer falls behind him finishing the job. When I think of Jonathan, I think of a literary legend come to real life. I think of Achilles or Hector or Beowulf. I can imagine him rushing up to the outpost, slashing, dodging, leaping, rolling, and when he gets to the top, raising Israel's flag in victory. Because Jonathan is awesome. He is not somebody to be messed with. But he's also humble and faithful. And what happens after Jonathan's assault? The Philistine army is thrown into a panic, and the ground itself shakes. When I was younger and I was reading this story, whenever I would read a story about something happening in Scripture, I would try to think of the link of cause and effect. I would think in human terms. I would think scientifically, okay, so the army gets thrown into a, into a tizzy. They get thrown into a panic. Why did that happen? Well, it must have happened because the news reached them that one assassin cleared out a whole outpost and it freaked them out. But the author makes it clear that Jonathan did not cause this panic. This is not a literary device to describe Jonathan's victory. I would tell my younger self that I needed to have more faith. I would have told myself that I needed to believe, really believe, that God acts in powerful ways on behalf of his people. Not just something that conveniently happens that we give credit to God and say, okay, now we can kind of tell our friends we know God is real and we have faith in him for a reason because here's this little thing that he did. No, God acts in powerful ways on behalf of his people, ways that we can't explain any other rational concept than God acted on our behalf. The final verses read, Then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and field and those in the outposts and raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. We talked about this last week. What was one of the signs that God had outstretched his arm against his enemies? Panic would grab hold of them. It is the hand of the Lord in action. Once God brings the panic, Saul drags his feet a little longer, and then he finally acts. The men rush out to meet the Philistines, only to discover that the panic of the Lord has caused the Philistines to start fighting each other. It's a story reminiscent of Gideon, charging down the hill to discover his enemies attacking each other. The Jewish people take advantage, and they win the day. This story should make us ask a question. When did God stretch out his arm? The answer to that is important. When did God decide to act? Right after Jonathan and his armor bearer acted boldly and with great faith. God responded to the faithfulness of just two young men and routed an entire army. Jonathan wasn't kidding when he said nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. 
I'm reminded of one of Jesus' most famous sayings found in Matthew 17, 20 through 21. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move, for nothing will be impossible for you. In the story of Jonathan's assault on the Philistine outpost, we find a good continuation and a balance for what we talked about last week. Last week we talked about how our God is an armless, that arms symbolize power and that God is all-powerful, that God can and will act with or without us, that God's will ultimately will be done, that God is utterly powerful and utterly free. He doesn't need us, but he commands us to act. Why? Because God wants to teach us, to partner with us, and to grant us responsibility because God chooses to. But as we see this week, God also chooses to reward initiative. When it is pursued as an extension of God's will and completed with humility and faithfulness, God chose to extend his arm in response to the incredible faith of two young men. And I can list off many examples from the Old Testament and the New where God doesn't act until His people show their trust through prayerful initiative. I think of the paralytic on the mat, right? When Jesus sees the faith of these these young men digging through the roof of a house to lower their friend in so Jesus can heal him. He rewards that initiative and heals that young man. Why? Scripture says, based on the faith of his friends. I can go on and on. God rewards initiative. Not that God needs it to act, as though God couldn't act if we didn't show initiative, but just that God wants to see it. God responds to faith. So let's bring this home. I believe that there is a battle to be fought in Hillsboro. I do. It sounds melodramatic, but I believe that God wants to do something here, that God has an enemy to defeat. I believe that battle is this. That God wants to see folks who are crippled, enslaved, beaten down, and addicted to sin to be healed, to be freed, to be lifted up and purified by Jesus Christ. Our battle hymn is the Great Commission. We are not called to be a big church. We are called to be a fruitful church. Our battle to be won is to see folks come to true faith in Jesus Christ and receive forgiveness, transformation, a mission, and eternal life. For some, we think the battle will be won if we just fight harder. If we come up with new programs, if we start knocking on doors, if we fashion the perfect argument or the perfect testimony, because that's what it takes, our blood, sweat, and tears. We need to mobilize the entire church, every person, to make something happen. And that sounds an awful lot like Saul to me. Like we're trying to fight the whole battle without God, believing it's all on us to achieve victory. For others, the battle we must fight feels too big. Those sword rattlers on the other side make us nervous and uncomfortable. So we wash our hands of it all, and we say, God will figure it out. God doesn't need me. So we don't share the good news with our neighbors. We don't participate. We leave it to someone else, and we grow complacent. The number of times I have heard a pastor deliver a message like this and say, We need to get out there. We need to do it. And then nothing happens.
I don't think it's due to a lack of initiative. I don't think that it's due to a presence of complacency. I mean, those definitely contribute, but do you know what I think it ultimately comes down to? Lack of faith. Lack of trust. People believing that this time it could be different. That just because we haven't seen change so many times doesn't mean we couldn't see it now. Because God acts when God wants as God wants. God still does mighty things to save his people. And God responds to initiative and prayerful consideration. For those who grow complacent and don't participate, that sounds an awful lot like Saul to me too. Sitting under a tree, just waiting for something to happen. And so we have the bipolar swing of Saul. On the one hand, we have folks in the church who think it's all on us, and there are folks in the church who think we don't have to do anything. But there's a middle ground, y'all. And I think that's where that we need to be living. It's not that the battle we fight, we fight it, and God shows up to help a little bit, I guess. It is that God fights the battle and allows us to participate, to do our part. Again, it's not that we fight the battle with God's help. It is that God fights the battle and allows us to participate, to do our part. Like the armor bearer following after Jonathan, delivering the coup de grace as Jonathan keeps charging the outpost, setting the tempo, taking on every soldier that comes at him. And we just follow behind, following orders, showing faith, believing in the one who is leading. This is a major shift in thinking. It doesn't fall all on us, but we do have a responsibility. God chooses to use us, and God acts when profound faith is demonstrated, even if it's demonstrated by a small group of people, even if it's just two, probably, teenagers who got a little overzealous and decided to go pick a fight. It wasn't the whole Israelite army that turned to the Lord. It wasn't even the king, the important guy. Just two young men who decided to go pick a fight while everyone else remained passive and afraid. God rewards initiative when it is aligned with his will and accomplished with humility and trust. So, I believe God has a battle for us to join him in right here in Hillsboro, right here at home. It's not that we fight it and God helps. It's not that God fights it alone and we sit on the sidelines but that God fights the battle he is going to win with or without us, and we go wherever God calls us to go. I believe that God wants to use us, to lead us, to guide us. God wants us to be fruitful, to show initiative and go pick a fight, but in a way that embraces his will and demonstrates humility and trust in the power of his arms. You want to go pick a fight? You want to go score a victory for God's kingdom? You want to see people delivered from the tyranny of sin and death? In churches, we always talk about this. We get the congregation fired up, then we go home and do nothing. That's not what we're going to do. We're going to go pick a fight. But before we do, and this is important, before we do, we must seek the will of God to see how God wants us to go pick that fight. So, if you want to join me in picking that fight and seeing people won for the kingdom, seeing something different happen this time, I challenge you to join me in prayer. I'm calling those who are willing to enter a month of prayer in which we seek what God wants us to do to win the people of Hillsboro for Jesus Christ. To pray every day with passion, humility, and a heart that actively listens for the direction of God. 
Because soon, we will be able to come back together as a family. It's a new season, a shifting of the tide. It's a great time to capitalize for the kingdom. We need to know what God wants us to do and how God wants us to fight when we come back. And I recognize that not everybody in our church is going to step up to this. I know that. It's human nature that some will get pumped up and try to do it all themselves according to their own will and power. They'll try to demonstrate piety on the outside, but they'll miss the point. They'll charge into the battle and cry over their shoulder, oh yeah, God, you can come too if you want. Others will give up. They will grow lethargic, sit on their hands, and expect nothing to change. That doesn't have to happen, but chances are it will, because not everybody is ready to charge the hill. But I'm looking for a few good men and women who are willing to look to the Lord in faith, to answer the call, to ask God how he wants us to challenge the enemy, to fall on their knees every day for the next month, to figure out how God wants to demolish the enemy's strongholds in Hillsboro, and then join me in strategizing and carrying out that plan. I'm reaching out to a few faithful people to show initiative, to answer God's call, to seek his will, and to listen carefully for what God wants us to do. And so if that's you, pray for it this month. And at the end of those 30 days, let's talk and watch God wreck some outposts in 2020.